first of all, this is my first experience with the Brazilian Bitcoin community. So let me ask, how many of you in this room have Bitcoin? Okay. How many of you do not have Bitcoin yet? All right. If you're sitting next to one of the people who do have Bitcoin, make sure that before you leave here today, you make them give you some Bitcoin. <laughs> not a lot, just a bit. Bitcoin is best experienced as a technology rather than explained. Learning about Bitcoin and experiencing how it can be used is the best way to understand what is the future of money. And you probably won't be in a room with this many people who have Bitcoin again anytime soon. So this is your opportunity. And those of you who have Bitcoin, please help people set up a wallet. Uh, give them a small amount. And if you want, I will be happy to do that as well uh, later on today. Um, I've written a book called Mastering Bitcoin. And uh, this book is for a technical audience. It is not about the economics of Bitcoin. It is not about the politics of Bitcoin. It is about the technology, how Bitcoin works, and how you build applications with Bitcoin. It was very important to me when I wrote this book to ensure that this knowledge could be shared with as many people as possible. And we started about uh, ten months ago a volunteer translation project, and more than 250 volunteers have been translating Mastering Bitcoin into 36 different languages, and 12 of those are complete. About four months ago, we completed the translation into Brazilian Portuguese. That book is available for free online as a PDF. You can download it uh, from the website bitcoinbook.info. You can download the PDF. It is under a Creative Commons open license. That means that you can not only read it for free, you can share it, you can sell it, you can mash it up, you can turn it into a university course or a high school course. You can use materials, photographs, quotes, any part of the book in any way you want. You can turn it into a rap poetry slam if you want. Don't, don't do that. Um, and the whole point of this is to spread the knowledge as much as possible. So I invite all of you uh, to go and check that out. What is Bitcoin, and why are we here today? Bitcoin is an innovation in the technology of money. How old is the technology of money? Who wants to hazard a guess? Who wants to guess? How old is money? Anyone? Since the Romans. Since the Romans? We need to go a bit further behind than that. Okay. How old is money? Anybody else want to hazard a guess? That's a good start. Romans. Let's go further back. How about Cro-Magnon? How about Neanderthalus? How about millions of years old, perhaps? And yet we don't even know how old it is, because what we have observed is that money emerges as a cultural artifact even among primate societies. Monkeys can learn how to use money, and so we believe that money is the oldest technology humans have developed. It is older than fire, it is older than the wheel, and it is perhaps as old as language itself, because money is language. Money is a form of language. And in these million years of development, money has experienced maybe four major technological changes. Money is abstract token, shells, beads, feathers, bones, things that are scarce in an environment, easy to transport, have aesthetic or primary value, and are used as an abstraction to express value to each other. Nuts, seeds, colorful feathers, beads, seashells. We see that throughout human society hundreds of thousands of years ago. And then the first major revolution in money was the use of precious metals in pressed coins, which goes back to perhaps Babylonian times, certainly popularized by the Romans, as you mentioned. That's the first technological adaptation of money. And for thousands of years, 
That's what money was, precious metals pressed with the faces of important people. And then the second great technological revolution of money was to change money from precious metals to pieces of paper that showed that you had a deposit of precious metals in banks. And the introduction of commercial banking, which in those days was a great liberalizing movement because it meant that money could now be used by people who were not part of the aristocracy. Until then, kings used precious metals, merchant class used precious metal, but most of the rest of society didn't really have access to the basic banking capabilities. And when the introduction of commercial banking and paper money, money changed. And it changed and it became a great equalizer and it gave opportunity to millions and then billions of people. So let me ask you, how do you think people reacted when paper money was introduced? Oh, that's a fantastic idea. Paper money, it makes perfect sense. It's light, I can carry it easily, I can give it to other people, they can exchange it for other paper money that has different numbers on it. This is much better. No, that was not the reaction. That was not the reaction. The reaction was, that's not money. That's not money. Give me real money. I don't believe in your fake money. I want the real money, the money you can bite to see if it's silver or gold, the money that has the face of the king on it. I want the real money. This paper money that's like a deposit slip for a bank account that maybe holds gold, who the hell knows? That's a scam. Now, the Italian master of scams, Mr. Ponzi, had not been born then, but if he had, they'd call it a Ponzi scheme. They didn't know what a pyramid scheme was, so they didn't call it a pyramid scheme, they just called it fraud. So the third revolution or the second revolution in money was greeted with universal disapproval. It took 400 years for people to get comfortable with the idea that paper money had value because they had to understand that the value of money does not come from the precious metals and it does not even come from the face of the king that stamped on the money it comes from the economic activity it creates through its exchange. It comes from the social bonds it creates. We make money valuable by using it. Money is a great societal illusion. If I believe that the piece of paper I have in my pocket will buy me six eggs tomorrow, because somebody else will take that to buy something else, that has value. And that illusion is what creates value, and the exchange is what creates value. And it's amazing because once you start talking about Bitcoin and people start asking questions about why Bitcoin works and what Bitcoin is, you realize that in order to have a conversation about what Bitcoin is and why it works, you first have to have a conversation about what money is and why money works. Because Ironically, the most important technology we have in our society is never discussed in school, is never discussed in science, is almost never discussed between parents and their children. And yet children ask the most interesting questions about money. Mommy, why can't we have more? Why do other families have more than we do? Why can't everyone have more? Why can't we make our own? These simple questions that children ask, and most parents have no way to answer that. What do you say? Susie, go study inflation and come back only when you understand the balance between inflation, hyperinflation, and stagflation. We don't discuss money, and yet it's a very important technology. In the 1950s, we saw probably the last and fourth greatest revolution in money the new technology of credit cards. A piece of plastic, which at first was a piece of paper, invented in 1950 by Diners Club, a piece of paper that represented a credit account that you could use instead of traveler's checks. And of course, everybody who saw this new form of money was like, oh, wow, this makes sense. I don't even need to carry all of those pieces of paper. This will be much more convenient. Let's all do this. No, that's not what they said. What they said was, this isn't money. We only take real money, Federal Reserve note dollars here, 
take your little diners club thing elsewhere, I don't understand it. And it took 30 years before people broadly understood that a piece of plastic is also money. Why? Because, because you can use it to buy eggs. And really that's the only definition of money you need to have. And now, almost a million years into this technology, Bitcoin comes along in 2009. And everybody goes, oh, that's brilliant. We don't need banks, we don't need governments, it's completely decentralized, let's all use this. Not quite. What they say is, that's not money. It's a Ponzi scheme, it's a pyramid scheme, it's fraud, it's not money, it has no value, it has the no face of a king or a queen on it, it doesn't have the official approval of a government, how could it possibly be worth anything? And yet I pay for my plane tickets with it. And somehow this not money allows me to get into a large steel tube and ascend to 37,000 feet and be transported across continents. That sounds like something that is money. I have been living on Bitcoin for more than three years. It is the vast majority of my income. That kind of sounds like money. I can use it to buy products and services. I earn it by selling my own services and products. That kind of sounds like money. But it's not money as we knew it. After a million years, we are now standing at the beginning of the fourth revolution of money. And we have money that is independent of governments and independent of banks. Money that allows every one of us not to have a bank account on our phone, but to have an entire bank on our phone. I have an application here that can generate two billion account numbers that gives me access to international wire transfers that allows me to do merchant processing, import export commerce with any country in the world and transmit and receive money at the speed of light anywhere for very little fees. I don't have a bank account in my pocket. I have a bank. Cuz banking is now an app and I am a banker. And you are a banker. And you are a banker. And we are all bankers, because none of us are bankers. And that fundamentally changes our relationship with money. And this money is not owned by any government, it's not controlled by any nation. I remember a time when the only airline I could take from my country had my country's flag on the tail of every airplane. And the only phone company that operated in my country was a national phone company that had its flag on the top of the building. And those were ridiculous ideas. The idea that you can only have an airline that belongs to a country and have exclusive monopoly over all airline operations is ridiculous. Why is it so ridiculous to think that the idea of a national currency with the flag of a nation on it that has complete monopoly within a country, why is that not ridiculous? It is. We just accept things because they've been that way for as long as we remember, not because they make any sense. And so now we have other options. Bitcoin allows us for the first time to have choices in the number of currencies we use. And it's important to understand that we have to look at Bitcoin from a different perspective. People ask me, which is the first country that is going to adopt Bitcoin? as its national currency. That would be a disaster. That is a terrible idea. That's an idea as terrible as the euro. Creating a monopoly of money with a national flag on it is the exact opposite of what Bitcoin is about. The idea of currency being a zero-sum geopolitical game of competition between nation-states is ridiculous. And Bitcoin is not going to play that game. That's not the point. Which country is going to adopt Bitcoin? The internet. The largest, most populous concentration of human beings collaborating in the world today is not a country. It is the internet. And the internet has its own currency. It has already adopted Bitcoin. Which banks will start using Bitcoin? None of them. 
Which countries will start using Bitcoin? None of them. Will Bitcoin replace national currencies? Of course not. Because money is a language. And if you think of money as a language, the idea of one universal money is as ridiculous as the idea of one universal language. You all speak English, right? Did that influence your decision to abandon Portuguese? Do you only learn one language because after all it is the universal language? There is no universal language, there is no universal money because there is no universal culture, there is no universal religion, there is no universal state. We are not a universal nation. We are a diverse species, so we have diverse language and diverse culture and diverse religion, and now we have diverse money. And if that's threatening to a government, the idea that individuals have a choice to use diverse money, then you have to ask yourself, why is my government threatened by financial freedom? And ironically, some of the governments that have currency crisis right now are not really threatened by Bitcoin. And neither should the banks be threatened by Bitcoin. What Bitcoin represents is opportunity. More than four billion people in the world have very, very limited or no access to banking whatsoever. Because of politics, because of geographic barriers, because of technological barriers, not because they have no value as productive human beings. And we have an opportunity with this technology and technologies like it to take four billion people and make them part of this new global economy. To give them access to the same financial power as a bank, without borders, without control, without censorship, and with full financial freedom, autonomy, and privacy. We live in a world where in the last 30 years, it has become the norm for individuals to have zero financial privacy. For every financial transaction you do to be surveilled, monitored, and controlled. And at the same time, governments have complete secrecy. And that world is upside down. Because the world I want to live in, individuals have privacy. And when you have not been convicted of a crime, you have freedom and privacy. And governments have no secrecy and full accountability and transparency, because after all, they are using our money. It is not theirs. And Bitcoin actually delivers that promise. It delivers privacy at an individual level that protects you against surveillance. And it creates a global public ledger that, when put in the hands of government, forces them to have transparency and accountability. Let every day be Panama Papers Day. So what Bitcoin brings, especially for a country like Brazil, is the opportunity to create diversity in finance, to give people choices to use multiple currencies, to unleash innovation and creativity, to help entrepreneurs build completely new businesses, new financial models, a new system of financial services to serve a completely different population that has never been served before. It brings the opportunity for young people to learn the future of money today, to see what money could be like in 10, 20, 30 years, to be part of a transformational force that is making money a borderless, open, decentralized system with no national flag, no government, no banking control, where power is shared among all of those who participate, just like the internet, making it much more resistant to corruption and serving the people who use it directly. And what do we need from governments and banks in order to do this? Nothing. Preferably nothing for the next five years. 
The best thing a government can do to help Bitcoin succeed is stay out of it for five years, at least. Because writing laws about a technology you don't understand is the worst thing you can do to that technology. Taking a system that can create opportunity for a country as diverse and enormous as Brazil is, where millions of people have no access to banking, and squashing that opportunity by creating laws for something you don't understand is a terrible idea. So, if anybody who is in government is listening, don't do anything for five years. You know why? Because other governments are going to be stupid, and they're going to pass stupid laws about technology they don't understand. Because they don't know where Bitcoin is going in five years. I don't know where Bitcoin is going in five years. We don't know. We're making history. This is the front seat of history in an innovation in money that none of us yet understands where it will go. Only the fourth time in a million years on the most important technology we have in our society. Leave it alone because you do not understand it. We do not understand it. Let it breathe. There are plenty of people who will try and fail to build companies with Bitcoin. Most of them will fail, but some will succeed. And they will create completely new industries from nothing that never existed before. Twenty years from now, the ten largest financial institutions in the world will be technology companies. They will have no accounts, no customers, no assets, no liabilities, no balance sheets, no banking branches, no ATMs. How can I say that? The largest taxi company in the world has no taxis and no drivers. The largest hotel company in the world has no hotel rooms. The largest content company in the world makes no content. The largest phone company in the world has no phones. And so it is not strange to think that the largest financial institution in the world will not have any banking customers or any banking branches or any ATMs or any debit cards or any accounts or liabilities or assets. They will be a technology company. And it might be a technology company that used to be a bank. If the banks are smart and realize that their business changed fundamentally on January 3rd, 2009, and there is no going back, there is no negotiating, there is no bargaining, there is no watering down, there is no censorship or control, there is no power structure, there is no inflated profit margin. Those things, poof, disappeared in 2009. And some will not accept that, and they will disappear. Fifteen years ago, the top five camera companies in the world were Kodak, Polaroid, Fuji, Nikon. Kodak invented digital photography in 1976 and buried it, because they were terrified of destroying their primary means of profit, which was selling the films and chemicals to process analog photography. And so they buried it, and they didn't take advantage of it, and they sat back and continued to milk their industry for 25 years, until one day, in the middle of the first decade of the millennium, a company that was not a camera company shipped one billion cameras. And that company was Nokia. And they had no way of anticipating that. And overnight, the camera business disappeared. And today, the top five camera companies in the world, Nokia, Samsung, Motorola, Apple, Google, none of them camera companies. And where is Kodak? Bankrupt. Polaroid? Bankrupt. Fuji? Almost bankrupt. Nikon? 
almost bankrupt. And they're all doing digital photography as fast as they can and failing. This can happen to banking, but it doesn't have to happen. Instead, in many countries where banking is an important service to deliver to real customers, where the importance of reaching banking out into rural populations and giving people control over their money and helping them achieve financial security is an important goal for banks. Bitcoin is not a threat. It's the greatest opportunity these banks have ever had. And those banks that achieve this opportunity will win. Brazil is going to be a hot spot for these financial technologies. It is a country with massive inequality, but massive opportunity. With a young and educated professional population that can achieve amazing things. With an enormous rural population that is cut off because of geography, that can be reconnected with the simplicity of a text messaging phone and Bitcoin, and have full financial control and freedom again. And so I see great opportunity and promise in Brazil. And that's why I have been so excited to be here and to be part of this amazing Bitcoin community. Thank you. Questions? Hello. Um, what do you think about today? Ah, you know, I, I've never been asked that question in Brazil yet. <laughs> <laughs> it only comes up at every meeting. Um, I'm I'm really uh, very interested in Ethereum. Um, I've worked in Ethereum from the very beginning. I've uh, watched closely the development. I've written smart contracts, and I continue to work in Ethereum. I think Ethereum is a fascinating technology. It shows um, how diverse the ecosystem of uh, blockchains and cryptocurrencies can be. Um, I think it's important to understand that it solves different problems from the problems that Bitcoin solves. And I think it coexists. In fact, it works best in coexistence with Bitcoin. Bitcoin provides robust security as a reserve currency and trusted ledger with very, very strong immutability and unforgeability. Um, and part of the reason it achieves that is by being simple in its construction, which means it can't do smart contracts. Ethereum is more complex in its construction, which means it can do smart contracts, but as a result, it loses some of the uh, robustness that Bitcoin has, which means they work very well together. Um, and can coexist very strongly together. I think we're going to see some very interesting things. Of course, you know, it, Bitcoin is still an experiment. It's seven years old. Ethereum is even more of an experiment uh, at one year old. And so we're going to see a lot of uh, change over time as we try to learn what it means to build smart contracts uh, on blockchains. What is or see would be the most likely reactions of the previous incumbents, banks, regulators, and so forth? Um, well, I've done a talk about that. It's called the five stages of grief. It starts with denial. Uh, denial is when clearly this is silly technology that cannot possibly work and Bitcoin will be dead soon. That lasted for the first three years of Bitcoin. Then it switches to anger. This is not correct. It must be stopped. Make it illegal. Ban it. Only criminals use it. It must be stopped. Um, that lasted for about a year. That didn't work either. Then we went to the third stage of grief, which is bargaining. Hey, yeah, Bitcoin is not that interesting. Blockchains are really interesting. How about we do blockchains without any of the things that Bitcoin does? Maybe we can keep all of the control, power, centralization, and do blockchains, and that way we won't be disrupted. That's been since the middle of 2014 until today. That's not going to work. Uh, the most interesting things that Bitcoin does is because it's open and decentralized, uncensorable, immutable, and unforgeable. Um, you can get some advantages with blockchains, but you can't get all of those advantages. 
And then we're going to go to depression. Aww. <laughs> but we had such a good run for two centuries. Why is everyone taking away our business now? Why do young people not want to bank Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, with high fees? Why do they want all of these cryptocurrencies instead, that work 24 hours a day? It's unfair. And finally, acceptance. At which point, I'm hoping that the banking industry will find that if you want to reach customers, if you want to make this an economy not of the two or three billion of the most privileged financial people, but you want to make it one global, seven and a half billion included human beings, Bitcoin is a solution, not a problem. It's a promise, not a threat. And then we all win. Hey, I'm glad to be here. About the decentralization. Uh huh. I am concerned about any form of centralization, and I would certainly like to see less centralization. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. The centralization in mining that we have today in China is the result of a very specific technology adoption curve that goes from CPU, GPU, FPGA, ASIC over a period of four years, with each change in architecture offering a 10,000 increase in performance, which means that all of the equipment is obsolete within two to three months which requires massive capital, access to chip factories directly, as directly as possible. It means that selling chips to others doesn't make economic sense, because if you keep them and mine them for two three months until they're obsolete, you win more than if you sell them. Um, and it means that, of course, access to cheap electricity um, makes a huge advantage. All of these factors together have created an enormously fast curve, but also centralization, primarily in, in China. And yet, we reached 16 nanometer fabrication, which means that the days of 10,000 performance increases and two to three month obsolescence are over. Moore's law is the fastest technological law we've had, except that compared to Bitcoin. CPU to ASICs, it's slow. It's 5,000 times too slow. And so over the next two years, we will not see a 10,000 time improvement. We will see a two times improvement, and that's really slow. And that means that instead of the equipment being obsolete in three months, it will now have a shelf life of two years. And that means that having chips and mining with them instead of selling them is no longer an advantage because you have all of the risks of warehouses and operations and government interference and electricity prices whereas if you sell the chips you can make a lot less risky money so what led to centralization of mining the whole of those parameters no longer exist mining changed about 6 months ago when we reached 16 nanometer the problem is we haven't seen that. It's going to take about a year and a half before you see the ripple effect throughout that industry. And the halving is going to be very important. But I don't think the centralization is going to last. The centralization was an artifact of performance increases that no longer exist, of limited shelf life that no longer exists, of advantages of centralization that now become risks of centralizations. Because if you put a hundred thousand miners in a warehouse and you lose power for two days, your entire profitability is wiped out for the month. But if you put 100,000 miners in 100,000 kitchens, and you use them to toast your bread, or cook your sausage, as Sven showed me the photos today, he cooked hot dogs on an Ant S7 miner. That was kind of cool. 
then you have the advantages of decentralization because if power goes off in one kitchen, it doesn't affect anybody, and your profitability doesn't depend on anything. Um, so all of the things that made Chinese centralization happen are now unmade. I also want to make another point. If mining centralization had happened in Sweden, a lot of people would be a lot less concerned. <laughs> and that's not just because the Chinese government is a threat to Bitcoin. Because if you think about it, the people who are doing mining in China are directly opposing their government by doing this. They're taking enormous risks. They are entrepreneurs of the finest capitalist attitudes who should be applauded with incredible engineering and operational skills. They're not their government and will resist and fight hard to maintain independence. We should applaud that, not fear it. And somehow I think if they were Swedish, we'd be less concerned. So there is an element of racism in this. There is an element of xenophobia. There is an element of stereotyping an entire race. And I think that's not that's wrong. Hi Andreas. Uh, I would like to live in the same country as you said, and individuals are granted privacy hundred percent and states uh, less conspiracy. But as far as my knowledge goes, uh, Bitcoin is hundred percent private. Is a hundred percent trackable. Trackable. So how can you ensure hundred percent privacy to individuals and to their own private transactions through Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency in a world like this, especially with technologies like one name that somehow goes in a direction where individuals trading Maybe Yeah, that's a great question. I think you've got to understand that Bitcoin is not 100% trackable. Maybe it's 75% trackable right now. If you compare that to Visa, which is 100% trackable, every time you make a Visa transaction, it's not just the Brazilian government that's watching you. It's like 10 different intelligence agencies all watching you at the same time. In fact, it is probably illegal for the Brazilian government to watch you. So what they do is they probably outsource it to Argentina, and you watch the Argentinians. That is usually how it plays out. <laughs> it is a nice way to get around democracy. Payment systems as we have them are 100 percent trackable. Bitcoin is 75 percent trackable now, but it is getting more private and will continue to get more private as time goes by. We have incredible innovations in the pipeline that take it from something that is partially trackable to something that is less and less trackable. You've got to understand there's a difference between mass and individual. Right? Bitcoin makes it possible if you have an individual who is suspected of a crime, and if there is proper judicial process to seize their computers and their wallets and see their addresses to track everything they've done. And that perhaps is desirable in society. What it makes it difficult to do is do mass surveillance of the innocent. And again, that is desirable in society that you can't do that, or certainly can't do it easily. But there's more inventions coming down the pipeline. Stealth addresses, confidential transactions, remixers, there's hundreds of other cryptocurrencies that you can convert your Bitcoin into and out of very easily. The entire system opens up a lot more freedom and privacy. And over time, it will get better, and we will have more and more privacy and anonymity in Bitcoin. So, and if you look more broadly than Bitcoin, there are certainly other cryptocurrencies that offer even more uh, privacy and anonymity for individuals. So, I'm quite optimistic that we are turning the tables and setting the world correctly, where we have privacy. And governments don't have secrecy. Uh, I want to know what's the main challenge that digital cryptocurrencies uh, will have to meet in order to popularize, in order to spread it uh, worldwide, and everyone uses it. So, what are the prerequisites for broader adoption? The challenges. What? The challenges. Yeah. What the digital oh. cryptocurrencies will you have to meet, will you have to face to popularize? Okay, fantastic. Let me do an audience question. How many of you find Bitcoin easy to understand? How many of you find Bitcoin easy to use? 
you're lying. <laughs> How many of you find Bitcoin easy to secure your individual wallets, to back up, to make available to your families in the case of your death or incapacity? Until everyone in this audience can do it, more importantly, until my mom can do it, Bitcoin cannot be adopted broadly. We have a lot of work to do, and that means taking a technology that at the moment is difficult to explain, difficult to use, difficult to secure on an individual basis, very secure on a global basis, but difficult to secure on an individual basis, difficult to plan for your retirement or to pass on to your family. All of these things need to be fixed. But you've got to look at it as an engineering problem, which is also an engineering opportunity. I sent my first email in 1989. In 1989, in order to send my first email, I had to download a mail client in source code, use a compiler to compile it into an executive application on a Unix system, on the command line, over a modem, on an account that I wasn't strictly speaking authorized to use, because I was 16 and I had access to the internet in 1989. You do the math. And after two, three hours of work with my Unix command line skills that I had just recently learned, I composed my first email. First, I had to find someone to send it to because there weren't that many people on the internet. And then I sent an email. And in the blink of an eye, just 36 hours later, it arrived at its destination. Now, if you asked me then, Will you do your banking, your shopping? Will your mom use this? Can you do video calling with your mom on this? I would say yes, but it will take 20 years. Exactly 20 years later, my mom sent her first email. And she didn't have Unix command line skills. She went like this on her iPad. That's what we have to do. Now, you can look at that as a challenge. I think of that as an opportunity. That opportunity created a multi-billion dollar industry for search, a multi-billion dollar industry for email, a multi-billion dollar industry for online services, a multi-billion dollar industry for internet service providers, a multi-billion dollar industry for tablets and mobile phones and personal computing devices and all of the other things that we've seen. So the person who sees it as a challenge is the pessimist. The person who sees it as an opportunity to create a billion dollar industry, I call that person an entrepreneur. And I see a lot of them in the audience today who are thinking, you know what? If I make Bitcoin easier, I build a very successful business. If I make Bitcoin easier to use, easier to secure, easier to understand, until you don't need to know how it works. So I'll turn around that question and say you don't need to understand Bitcoin to use it. Because I guarantee you, there are not more than two or three people in this room who understand how TCP IP windowing, Las Vegas QoS properties within TCP work, how an HTTP protocol message is formed. Anybody? One, two, three. Boom, bingo. And those are the developers in the room. And we all use the internet without needing to understand any of that. Bitcoin is successful and will be adopted broadly when you don't need to understand anything about how it works, and yet you can use it, and then my mom can use it. Hey. Um, you said that already said to us, uh, what do you think about the role in the future of the outcomes? You know, I, when I started working in Bitcoin, I believed that we would see maybe one, two, three, four, five different currencies that could succeed in different ways, and that they would have to fight each other for dominance. Um, and I was wrong, because I was looking at Bitcoin from the perspective of experience with national currencies, and that's how national currencies behave. Uh, they're in a zero-sum game. 
Once I saw that more altcoins were being created and they acted as a laboratory, I realized the connections between money and language and why, just like there are hundreds of thousands of human languages, there will be hundreds of thousands of alternative currencies and chains, and then perhaps millions. And they will continue to be created at a rate of thousands per year, and then tens of thousands per year. And maybe most of them will not have very significant economic value. Maybe some of them will only have um, the value of reputation, or loyalty, or popularity, or historical significance. Or they'll explore a single narrow feature or capability. There will be thousands, and they will all have value to someone. Because even five-year-olds create currencies. If you watch a kindergarten, they create currencies out of rubber bands and colored blocks and crayons. They trade tokens of value with each other to express popularity and friendship. So human beings create currencies. It's a natural process. It's an evolutionary imperative. So we will create thousands of them, and they may not have the same interest or value, but they will be powerful. You know, I say sometimes people think it's funny, but imagine what happens when you have Justin Bieber coin. Now, for one thing, that's a horrifying idea, Justin Bieber coin. But at the same time, if that was created today, it would very quickly have more value than at least 15 national currencies. <laughs> Easily. Right? And so, is that money? It is to a Justin Bieber fan. It's meaningful, it's valuable, it's exchangeable. It creates loyalty and social connection. We are redefining how we see money, from a field of narrow perspective and monopolies, to an explosion of diversity that will flood our brains with thousands of currencies. And hopefully one day it will be so easy to use any of them, that it will become irrelevant which currency you use, and currency will simply disappear into the background. Part of my question was almost the same. Um, I would just add that uh, how do you feel about all these private companies that are trying to get to the blockchain part of the and, and, and trying to uh, implement the consensus that just applying to private um, blockchains? And, and how can this be, if, if it can be still, if it can be productive, or if it will be just another altcoin that maybe it's just another form of or something like that, and how um, other forms of um, discussions like the core and plastic things form can add, um, affect the broad use of financial systems which rely on some kind of stability. Very good. Um, let me take the first one, then I'll try and tackle the second one. We don't have enough time, perhaps, for a broad discussion about scaling classic and core. Um, so to the first question, what happens when private companies make private ledgers and private blockchains and private coins? How many of you work at a company that has an intranet that uses an internal network with an internal wiki and an internal email system? Right? How cool is that? It's not cool. And yet when the internet started, a lot of companies thought that that's great. But the internet is going to be full of perverts and criminals and fraudsters and weirdos, and anyone can publish, and that's a terrible idea because most of it will be crazy ideas. So how about we take that and we make a closed system where we control who publishes and who connects, and we make a nice system that is suitable for all ages, kind of a Disney version of the internet. CompuServe, AOL, Prodigy, all of these systems that companies built, they failed. And the reason they failed is because they misunderstood what was the value of the internet. It wasn't the ability to send and receive data. It was the equalization of everyone as both producer and consumer, and the opportunity to have an open environment where everyone has the freedom to speak and be heard by anyone, anywhere, without controls, without censorship. That was the real value of the internet. And the real value of Bitcoin is a borderless, global, uncensorable, open, 
system that allows anyone to innovate and access without asking for anyone's permission. And if you take that and you turn it into a closed, borderful, censored, controlled system, it is boring. It will generate profits for some, but it's not interesting in the broader sense. And once you create all of these little systems, you will have to connect them together. Bitcoin is the internet of money. If you build an intranet of money, eventually you'll want to connect it to the internet of money. And you'll connect it via Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the interesting blockchain. The others may be interesting for narrow purposes, just like the Justin Bieber coin is interesting to Justin Bieber fans. You know, the JP Morgan Chase coin will be interesting to JP Morgan Chase executives and very few other people. It certainly won't be as successful as Justin Bieber coin. Um, when it comes to classic and core, I think it's important to understand that Bitcoin is undergoing a debate. And in the traditional systems of money that we know, when a debate lasts too long, the boss stands up and says, "That's enough debate. Here's what we're going to do." Well, there's no boss in Bitcoin, so no one can say, "That's enough debate. Here's what we're going to do." We have to all agree, and Bitcoin is difficult to change. And the process of changing dif the difficult to change Bitcoin is loud and it's noisy and it's full of debate and argument and accusations and drama. Where I come from, we call that democracy. Now, you may not have seen democracy in financial systems before. It may be a new phenomenon, but that's not a problem for Bitcoin. That is its greatest strength: the fact that no one can impose. A decision on everybody else. Core can't, even if it might look like they can. Classic can't. They each hold veto over each other. Consensus is much more broad and nuanced than we understand. And democracy looks messy. If you want efficiency, then just put one company or person in charge, and you will get efficiency. The price is freedom. We buy freedom by paying the price of inefficiency. And I will make that choice every single time. Thanks.